Hello Brewers and welcome to another episode of Ultra Low Brewing. In this video, we'll be running through the step-by-step -step process of our brew day on this hazy pale ale. Originally designed with leftover hops and grains that I need to make use of, we created this juicy tasting, non-alcoholic, hazy pale ale. Using the high mash temperature and low gravity method, this beer came in at just 0.5% ABV and has a nice piney flavour up front with juicy fruity tropical flavours following through and a smooth balanced bitterness with a nice amount of dryness. A perfect beer for a nice summer session or all year round if you love a good hazy. I've listed the recipe in the description below along with some key notes to observe to get as close to this beer as possible. Alternatively, you can follow the link to the Brewfather app to view the recipe and notes as well as save it for future use. I have also included a link to our website which has some great reading material, experiments and recipes to help you along your low and no alcohol brewing journey. Let's take a look at the process and get started. To start with, we'll need to measure our grains. First up is pale malt. This will add some of our fermentables and bring a touch of maltiness and colour. Following that is Maris Otter which has a rich, nutty flavour that helps add to that malty backbone. Being that this is one of our main base malts, it's a good idea to keep it to a low percentage of the grain bill to reduce the fermentability of our wort. Next is Melanoidin malt. This will add a rich, bready maltiness to help balance the flavour of the hops and add some extra complexity along with adding to the colour and deepen the hue. I'm also using some flaked barley. This will impart a rich, grainy malt flavour while also adding proteins to the beer to increase body and mouthfeel. It'll also help improve head retention. Lastly, I'm going to include some crystal pale malt. This will add a mild sweetness to help balance the bitterness of the hops and add some extra complexity to help increase the body and mouthfeel, along with adding to the colour to deepen the hue further. If you don't have these grains on hand, you can easily take the recipe into your local home brew store and have it weighed and milled in store ready to go. Now that I have weighed the grains, I need to run it through my mill. I run a very wide gap of 1.3mm between my rollers, which helps reduce my mash efficiency due to the coarse crush of the grains, making it harder for the enzymes to convert the full amount of starches in the grains. If you're getting a brew store to mill the grain for you, you can request their wider setting they have available to help reduce the efficiency on your batch. Now that the grain has been milled, it's time to move on to the mashing. I start with filling my mash pot with RO filtered water. As I'm doing a full volume mash, I fill the pot with a full amount of water required to reach my final volume. If using scheme water, it is important to treat the water before brewing to remove the chlorine from the water to prevent off flavours. With my pot filled to my required amount, I place the lid on, turn the heat on, and set my controller to a strike temperature of 82 degrees Celsius. While that's heating up, I'll measure my water salts. Because I'm using RO filtered water, I need to add minerals back into the water. Starting with a good dose of calcium sulfate, commonly known as gypsum, this will crisp up the taste and add some dryness to the beer, while emphasizing the hot bitterness. After that, will be some calcium chloride, adding a fullness and roundness to the beer, creating a denser, fuller mouthfeel and some extra body. Magnesium sulfate, also known as Epsom salt, is also added as a nutrient for the yeast and a touch more sulfate. Lastly, I'll add some sodium chloride or table salt. This adds a little more chloride, but also adds a little savory touch to bring out some more maltiness in the beer. With the salts weighed, it's time to check on the water. With the water heating up close to my set temperature, now is a great time to add the brewing salts to dissolve nicely before I get to my strike temperature. Remove the lid 
and sprinkle the salts on top of the water. Give the water a gentle stir to ensure they're mixed well. Next, add the mesh grain bag to the pot. This will make it easy to remove the grains after the mash. Now that the water has reached my set temperature of 82 degrees Celsius, it's time to add the mill grain. Carefully pour the grain into the pot. And give it a gentle stir to break down any lumps that may have formed and ensure it's properly mixed. Now we place the lid back on, set the timer for 30 minutes and leave it to mash away. After 15 minutes, give the wort a gentle stir to make sure it's thoroughly mixed before taking a quick sample to check the mash pH in case I need to make any adjustments before the boil. I find it easy and simple to use a syringe to draw out my sample and quickly cool down to my calibration temperature. Place the lid back on and finish the mash cycle. With the 30 minutes finished, it's time to lift the lid and remove the grain bag. Carefully lift the bag above the pot and drain the wort from the grain. Give the bag a good squeeze to get the last of the liquid from the grain and discard the bag. With the grains removed, I transfer the fresh wort to my boil kettle. If you're using an all-in-one brewing kettle, such as the Bruzilla or Grainfather systems, or doing this in a single pot, either over a gas burner or on a stovetop, you don't need to transfer the wort for the boil. Instead, just heat the pot or kettle until it reaches a rolling boil. With the wort transferred, it's time to move on to the boil. The first thing I need to do is ramp up the heat. Turn the system up to full power so I can reach a good rolling boil. This is also the best time to measure the specific gravity of the wort to ensure I've reached my target pre-boil gravity. I like to use a refractometer for this stage as I can take a few drops and quickly cool the sample to get a reading fast so I can make any dilutions if necessary. With my sample taken, I place the lid on to speed up the heating process. While that's heating up, we'll measure out our hops. For this recipe, I'll be using some Warrior for my 30 minute bittering addition at the start of the boil. The second hop addition will be a flame out addition consisting of some Centennial, Mosaic and Simcoe for a big flavor and aroma addition. These hops will impart big tropical fruity flavors such as passion fruit, stone fruit, mango, citrus, and even some pine. With both of the hop additions measured out, it's time to check on our boil. With the pot now at a nice rolling boil, it's time to add my first hop addition and set the timer for 30 minutes. With the 30 minutes done, it's time to cut the heat to my boil and remove my insulation. Because I'm doing a flame out addition, I need to add my second lot of hops to the hot work and let that stand for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes has passed, give the wort a gentle stir. Then with a syringe, I'll take a small sample so that I can cool it quickly and measure my post boil pH so that I can determine how much acid I need to add to adjust prior to pitching. I'll also take another small sample to quickly cool so that I can measure my post boil gravity, which will then become my original starting gravity. With a sanitized hose, I need to transfer my hot wort to a cleaned and sanitized food safe plastic container to cool naturally overnight. If you've used a chiller to cool the wort, you can transfer it directly to your fermenter, ready for your pH adjustment and yeast pitch. By no chilling, I save time and water that would usually be used to rapidly cool the wort. If you want to chill the wort, you may need to either adjust your bittering hops to increase the bitterness slightly to match or stick with the current recipe for an extra juicy beer. I don't want to transfer all of the liquid because there is a lot of tube and hot matter at the bottom of the pot that I want to leave behind. 
With the wort safely transferred, remove the hose and put the cap back on tight. You can now place the cube in a bath of cool water to lower the temperature a little faster, or you can keep it in a cool place overnight to let the temperature drop naturally. With the sample I took post hop stand now cooled, I will need to measure my wort pH to determine how much acid I will need to add to ensure it will finish within a food safe level below 4.6 to prevent pathogenic spoilage. It is important to use a freshly calibrated digital meter to ensure you get an accurate reading. I'll be adding a small dose of lactic acid to lower my pH to 4.3 using a 1ml syringe to make accurate measurements. Keeping in mind, dry hopping will raise the pH of the beer, so aiming lower than your target may be necessary. It is important to lower the pH prior to pitching the yeast. With regular beer, the yeast drops the pH quite a lot, but with ultra-low and non-alcoholic brewing, the micro-fermentation doesn't provide enough time for the yeast to lower the pH, so manual intervention is needed to prevent pathogenic spoilage, increase shelf life, and of course, for flavour perception. For this recipe, I've chosen to go with Lallemann's Windsor Ale Yeast. Being maltotriose negative, this will help lower my attenuation, giving me a lower ABV with a fuller mouthfeel and body, as well as some mild esters. With the wort having cooled down overnight to 19 degrees Celsius, and my acid added to lower the pH, it is time to pitch the yeast. Remove the lid from your fermenter, and gently sprinkle the yeast on top of the wort. With the yeast added, place the lid back on. Alternatively, you can use cling wrap and an elastic band to create a sealed cover. Then, place the fermenter in a temperature controlled fermentation chamber or a cool space in your house to maintain a steady fermentation temperature around 19 degrees Celsius for seven days. This recipe also includes a dry hop addition with two days left of our fermentation cycle, consisting of some more mosaic and some Vic Secret. This will add even more fruity and tropical flavours to really emphasise that juicy taste. Once the hops have been measured out, we'll add them to a cleaned and sanitised hop sock. Carefully remove the lid from the fermenter, and with our hop sock filled, carefully drop the hops into the fermenter. And quickly seal the lid to limit any oxygen or bacterial exposure. After having the beer fermenting for seven days, it's time to check for our final gravity to ensure fermentation has finished. Drop the hydrometer into a degassed sample of the wort at the calibrated temperature and wait until it has reached a steady balance to determine the gravity reading. It is important to measure samples of the wort over two to three days to be sure no further activity has taken place. Once fermentation has finished, if you have the capacity to cold crash the beer, you can do so for two to three days to drop any suspended yeast and or sediment before you transfer it to the keg. If not, then you're ready to package the beer. With a cleaned and sanitized keg, I cover the opening with aluminium foil, then purge the keg through the liquid outpost so that the CO2 travels through the dip tube and pushes any oxygen upwards and out of the keg. This will help limit oxygen exposure. I then attach a cleaned and sanitized hose to the fermenter and set the other end of the hose at the bottom of the keg with a small curl to prevent the beer splashing as it transfers and avoid oxygenation. You'll want to loosen the lid so that the beer can free flow out of the fermenter. If you're using a closed transfer system, attach your CO2 line instead. Once the beer has reached close to the tap level, turn off the tap as we don't want to draw any extra air through the hose that can oxidize the beer. Then place the sanitised lid on and lock it into place. We are now ready to hook it up to the gas to do a final purge and set it for carbonation and conditioning. With my keg in the fridge, I attach my gas line and start filling it with CO2. Once it has started to fill, I pull the PRV ring numerous times to vent the gas and try rid it of any oxygen that may be present in the headspace. With the keg purged, I leave it connected to the gas for two weeks to carbonate and condition until it's ready to drink. 
That's all there is to make this great tasting, non-alcoholic, tropical, hazy pale ale. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment and subscribe to the channel for future videos. Until next time brewers, cheers.